Hello, Dr. Lazar, thank you very much for joining me on this episode. We're gonna talk all about the more cosmetic side of pelvic floor vaginal rejuvenation, and I'm looking forward to sharing your expertise. So if you can start out by just introducing yourself, what you do, how you became a urogynecologist, and then we will jump into some questions. Hi, it's good to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, okay, so how did I become a urogyn? Well, um, that's a good question because you don't wake up one morning going, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, and I certainly love what I do. So uh, I really like the challenge of obstetrics and gynecology. I think that was the key. Uh, you have you know, wonderful kind of patients. Uh, you have complicated problems. You're looking after moms and babies and you get to do really cool surgeries. And I think that's probably where it began, the just the challenge of all that. Uh, and then you sort of have one experience after another that take you on this journey. Um, and I've had some amazing mentors over the years. And, you know, they said, oh, you know, you kind of seem like you're enjoying this part of ob gyne And, you know, have you thought about doing more of this? And, well, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. And, and um, just... You know, through that, you know, one path leads to another. Uh, and um, I, I, you know, for a while thought, oh, maybe oncology was my thing or infertility. Uh, but I really enjoy uh, the surgical aspect, really enjoy working with patients, uh, really, really like uh, quality of life type um, outlets in terms of, you know, medicine. And, you know, how can we improve this person's quality of life? Uh, through, you know, interventions, whether it's non-surgical or surgical. And Eurogyne is the is a great platform for that. Awesome. Cool. And we're going to talk about both the surgical and the non-surgical that you offer in your clinic. So I want to start out just by a couple of definitions. So oftentimes with pelvic reconstructive surgery, you'll see plasty and you'll see pexy. So what is the, what are those to kind of, I guess, that they're like the end part of the word. What do they mean? Where do they come from? Perfect. Uh, so I think you have to kind of look to maybe the Latin and Greek background because pexi would be uh, to lift uh, and so to, to bring up, whereas plasti, I think, would be to make normal. Uh, and so, you know, people might argue with those definitions, but so, you know, <laughs> Um, you think about a, um, um, a sacro culpo pexi, you know, so you've basically got three words there brought together. And so in a situation like that, what you're doing is you're lifting up really the vagina, the top of the vagina, um, and attaching uh, the culpo, the vagina, to the sacro, uh, which is the sacrum. And so you are pexing that and you are attaching it and lifting it up. Um, Whereas you would do a vaginoplasty, and what you're doing is rest restoration or returning to normal of the tissues of the vagina, um, maybe you know uh, from aging, from childbirth, uh, trauma, different things. Okay, so I want to start with vaginoplasty because I, I know that is uh, something that's offered cosmetically, I guess you can say, for uh, through many surgical offices. But I guess when I when I look at if I'm reading what is happening on a website or a description of it, is the process the same as a colporophy, anterior or posterior colporophy? Would it be, because when you're doing a prolapse surgery, the, like a bladder or rectocele repair, there's an incision into the vagina, pushes back the bulge, sew that back up. And in, if I understand correctly, vaginal plastic, you're going in through the vagina and making that incision, maybe there's no bulge to push back, but is it sort of the same? Mm, that's a great question. And the answer is, I think it's very similar. I think uh, the difference is the indication, is the why. Uh, what The what, you know, your, your, uh, or the how is really this, the, the colporophy or the anterior repair or posterior repair or vaginoplasty, different words maybe for the very similar things, but the why is different. And so when you look at somebody who may have pelvic organ prolapse, you know, well, let's go back. What is pelvic organ prolapse? So it's it's 
I liken it to a hernia because people get that. They're like, oh, yeah, I had a hernia or, you know, my husband had a hernia of his belly button or his inguinal hernia and, and that was fixed. And so a hernia is a weakness in the supportive layer or supportive tissue. Um, when it comes to prolapse, that could be the supportive layer uh, in the front wall of the vagina, between the vagina and the bladder. It could be in the back wall of the vagina, between the vagina and the rectum. And so that's a prolapse. That's a hernia in the supportive layer, and the rectum bulges into the vagina, just the same way the bowel can, you know, protrude into the belly button. When and so you're you're doing a functional repair when you're doing a prolapse repair because you are restoring uh, a damaged or attenuated layer so that it is back to normal, so that the patient functions normally. You can empty your bladder properly. You can empty your rectum properly. You don't have the discomfort of a bulge in the vagina, right? Um, and then when you're talking about a, you know, a, a cosmetic surgery, the surgery itself is similar, except that there really isn't a bulge there. Uh, what we're doing is we're making, uh, restoring the vagina back to the way it was, let's say before aging, before, you know, childbirth. Um, so the principles are the same, but it, there wouldn't be prolapse for a cosmetic procedure necessarily. And in a vaginoplasty, where would, is there one incision or multiple incisions and are like they're inside the vagina? Is that correct? Yeah, that's the nice thing about this surgery. It's as, as minimally invasive as as you can be. You know, it's not abdominal, it's not laparoscopic surgery. Uh, there are instances where we do that, but for the most part, when we're talking about uh, doing a prolapse procedure for the you know anterior wall, the front wall of the vagina, or the back wall, or a vaginal plasty, uh, it's all done through the vagina. And what we're doing is very small incisions, as you mentioned. Uh, it can be multiple incisions. So usually, uh, you, you know, you want to address what's going on in the front wall of the vagina uh, through a small incision and then the back wall of the vagina. And those are in the midline. Incision is usually anywhere from, you know, let's say, you know, three to four or five centimeters. Um, and we repair that uh, at the end of the case. And oftentimes you don't see... Uh, any stitches or anything anywhere because it's all, um, you know, hidden inside. And what would be the recovery time be? Is it similar? I know there can be different recovery times depending on the length or how involved a surgery is. The most typical we think of is a six week. So what would the recovery guidelines be for a vaginoplasty? Right. And so any type of vaginal surgery for the most part, I, I usually say, look, um, by the de next day after surgery, uh, you're up and walking, you're eating and drinking, oftentimes peeing normally. You can shower, uh, you can do stairs. Um, if it's minor surgery, you can drive a car usually within 24 hours. Uh, in terms of, uh, we'd say no heavy lifting, no vigorous exercise, hot tubs or swimming, and no penetrative sexual intercourse. And that's, for the most part, six weeks. Um, but this is an interesting number, six weeks. Like, where did that come from? Um, and is there evidence to support the six-week thing? And so what I tell patients is, you know, need to listen to your body. Nobody knows better than you. You'll, you'll find that, uh, you know, depending on what was done, um, that, you know, if, if, if you're doing more activity, if you're up and walking more, um, then, and, and things are going well, we'll keep going. You know, if you're having pain or swelling or, you know, issues, um, you know, reach out to us or, you know, maybe it's time to dial that back a little bit. Uh, you know, the stitches are still dissolving and so the stitches can take some time to dissolve. And so certainly, you, you know, it can be uncomfortable to have stitches in the vagina and so um, we need those to resolve. But healing and recovery are very different things. And typically I'll say, look, you know, we're at your six-week visit. I want you to slowly start to do all the normal things that you like to do, whatever, you know, that happens to be, whether it's working, traveling, um, whether it's, uh, you know, exercise, intimacy, you need to slowly get back to doing what's normal for you, whatever your goals are. Um, but you haven't really healed yet. We know that there's a lot of scar formation um, still remaining at six weeks that, that, that does need to heal. 
And so, you know, you don't really get to see the full benefit until three months from surgery, six months. And your body, to some degree, is healing all the way out to about 12 months from surgery. Yeah, uh, totally agree. And I know you have a pelvic floor physiotherapist in your office. Is it part of whether the person is coming in for the, you know, the, the, the government covered surgeries or the, the cosmetic surgeries, does pelvic floor physio play a role regardless? Yes, absolutely. I'm a huge uh, proponent of pelvic floor physio. You know, this is a team effort. Um, I think that the patient is the captain of the team, not the physician. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that, that really, you know, direct therapy based on their goals, right? My job is to get you where you want to be, you know, and to help you with that. So maybe, you know, I'm the quarterback, but they're the captain. And so they, they choose, they get to decide, you know, what their journey is going to look like. I'm here to provide good, safe, evidence-based options. Yeah, I love that. Um, and so um, this is a team effort. And, and so pelvic floor physio plays a role. We have uh, a great network of pelvic floor physios. Um, in BC, pelvic floor physiotherapy is not a covered benefit by the government. That's a problem because a lot of patients can't access pelvic floor physiotherapy for economic reasons. It's a burden, it's very expensive, and it needs to be covered. Um, this is a no-brainer. It prevents people from needing surgery. There's a huge cost savings to the system, and it's a win for patients. So if we can um, treat them just with pelvic floor physio alone, it often, you know, it, it, it helps. It's, um, surgery is not always the answer. Sometimes it is, but not all the time. The other thing is uh, we have, you know, wonderful nurses, nurse continence advisors, um, who, again, play a critical role in non-surgical management, whether it's counseling, whether it's uh, pessary fittings, um, you know, and so, so this is a team effort. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, a, labio, a labia plasty is what I'm moving on to now. So plasty meaning returning to normal. So we're now talking about the labia and this could be menorah or majora. Is that correct? So yes. And I'm going to be a little bit careful about how I use the term normal. Uh, it's extraordinarily rare to see an abnormal labia. Patients come in, they have a vision of what they want, but they, their labia, their vulva is normal. There's nothing wrong. There is no, I refuse to believe that there is a norm um, that, uh, you know, that there, that there are parameters. Uh, so, you know, labia come in all different shapes and sizes. They are perfectly imperfect all the time. Now, yes, trauma could be an exception. Uh, female genital mutilation is obviously an exception. Um, but when it comes to labia, menorah, majora, um, the, you know, it's perfectly imperfect. There, there are changes uh, or differences in symmetry, size, shape, texture, um, proportionality, uh, pigmentation, and it's all normal. My job is to give women a safe option uh, if they want to go from one version of normal to another. Yeah, I love that. And so, um, uh, a family member of mine had a friend uh, in her early twenties who was, uh, who had a labiaplasty and it was because she was, she had constant irritation from exercise, from certain clothing items. So is this a reason why somebody would potentially pursue a labiaplasty? And then if they, for whatever reason they're choosing it, how is the procedure done? Right. And so, you know, different motivation for having the procedure, whether it's cosmetic, functional, um, you know, typically um, there's never any guarantee that discomfort is going to change with surgery. And certainly surgery has risks, uh, including creating discomfort or pain. The um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, person's decision, it's it, they deserve to have the option uh, autonomy to make a decision over how they want their body to look, whether a patient decides whether it's a breast lift, you know, after aging and having children, whether it's a labioplasty. Um, certainly uh, there's options and, you know, you know, whether it's, 
we don't tend to make any judgment in terms of what your motivation is. Um, we just want to provide good, safe options. Yeah. I'm not sure if I addressed your question. Yeah. So well, the second part of the question was, um, what was how is a how is a labiaplasty performed? I guess oh, it would yeah. be okay. dependent on the goals of the person. So for in, if this person had, uh, you know, a, a part of the labia that was it was constantly being irritated, then it would be looking at how we can reduce that. It's so that's a tough one because, like I said, there's never a guarantee that that it's going to make a difference. Um, and so I, I usually try to um, be very realistic about expectations in that, you know, I don't think necessarily you're going to see a significant change uh, in discomfort and maybe other options. Um, if we're talking about a cosmetic change, then yes, there's, you know, that's an easily achievable goal uh, through surgery. Um, yeah. Sorry. And then how, so is it, it's, is part of the labia removed or how, and then, so then there's mm -hmm. also labia fat grafting. So are the, I'm assuming one is sort of removal and one is adding like plumping up almost. Yeah. So with respect to, um, the labia majora, you can remove uh, tissue if there's a lot of redundancy or deflation, uh, and, uh, or you can, uh, graft where you remove fat from one part of the body and then, um, position it within the labia majora. Um, and so oftentimes that's just done from removing a wee bit of fat, uh, you know, from the area just underneath your belly button and then, um, putting that into the labia majora. So that would be a fat grafting procedure. It's commonly done there. It's commonly done with breast augmentation, although it's outside of my wheelhouse. The uh, labia minora reduction uh, is basically done through a variety of different techniques uh, to remove part of you know, the labia minora. Certainly, we don't want to remove um, too much. Uh, you know, you want to really to create a very natural, normal, very natural, got to be careful about the word normal. So a very natural um, look that the patient is going for. You know, we right. advise, uh, we advise people to be very conservative uh, when we're talking about removing any tissue. Yeah. Right. And I would think the, from a, a population who might be pursuing the grafting side, because as we approach and move beyond menopause, we have uh, atrophy that happens, it can affect our vulva tissues. Is that, do you see that that is kind of coinciding with the population that will generally pursue that? Right. And so you have to, and that's a conversation we have with every patient is the natural changes that occur throughout a, a woman's lifespan, whether it's before, you know, you have kids, uh, certainly with pregnancy, there can be changes afterwards, uh, weight change, weight loss, weight gain. Uh, affects proportionality, uh, particularly of the labia majora, and then uh, also menopause and shrinking of the labia minora. And so what people don't realize is that you're, I, I liken it, the analogy is you, you need to buy an outfit that's going to look good for decades, right? And so you have to buy that, that you're buying that perfect outfit that has to look good whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or and up, right? Um, and so we need to think about that uh, and the changes that occur over the course of your lifetime so that it always um, looks the way you want it to look, right? To get that goal, yeah. Not just mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. This so, isn't um, fast fashion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, moving on to the clitoris. So there's clitoral hood reduction and clitoropexy. So again, the pexy meaning a lift or I guess fixation so right. what, what are those two procedures? Who would pursue them and how are they performed? So typically, uh, again, it's, it's a matter of proportionality. So oftentimes we'll have patients who've had uh, labia minora reduction and uh, all of a sudden the clitoris is now out of proportion to the rest of uh, the vulva, um, you know, per the patient's goals. And so uh, sometimes we are... Uh, bringing the, usually it's the focus on the clitoral hood and not the clitoris itself. Uh, and so what you're doing is removing excess skin uh, or bringing the clitoris in towards the body. Um, occasionally uh, removing some of the clitoral skin uh, to unhood a small portion of the 
clitoris itself or just the glands clitoris because really you don't get to see most of the clitoris um and so so and then they occasionally lift which is um procedure that we perform very rarely mm -hmm. and why would somebody pursue those is it is it the, the the appearance or is it from a functional perspective is it maybe they they don't have as much capacity for arousal or what would be what are the improvements they would be looking to address or, or looking for I, I would say this is mostly cosmetic in terms of arousal I think you're you're getting into a very complicated equation uh, we know that arousal may have to do with clitoral sensation it may have to do with vaginal penetration and it mostly has to do with what's going on up here mm -hmm. um, in, both in the moment in your life uh, in your relationship um, you know uh, you know, what's happening with the kids and you know mm -hmm. work and finances and everything else and, and being present in the moment it's a very complicated equation mm -hmm. um, typically we're talking about um, more cosmetic uh, goals than anything else uh, the and and we always sort of say look there's a there's a cost and a benefit to everything uh, and what is the cost of doing this or any other type of surgery um, and when I think of cost you know I really what I should be using is the term value um, because uh, we don't want to cause a complication uh, that will uh, have a, a really negative impact on your quality of life right whether it's the way it looks cosmetically, whether there is discomfort or pain afterwards. And so very cognizant of value. There has to be a real tangible upside for the patient in terms of what their goals are uh, before considering any type of intervention, particularly surgery. Yeah. Um, are there any other surgical procedures that are done cosmetically that I haven't asked about before we move on to the non-surgical? I think you've kind of covered a good portion of it. If anything comes to mind, I'll, I'll bring it up, but um, yeah. I think that's All good. right. Okay, so moving on to non-surgical options. If I look at what I, what is currently offered and there may be others, but the two pre predominant, the three predominant ones are Morpheus 8, V, V-Tone and PRP. So I want to start with Morpheus 8. So many, uh, even med spas now have vaginal rejuvenation therapies that could include laser or um, heat uh, like different types of light sources. There's all, there's different technologies available to help address certain challenges within the pelvic floor, within the walls of the vagina. So what is the technology of Morpheus 8 and what is it looking to address? Okay, perfect. I'm going to address the last part of the question first. Okay. Because uh, I think you need to look at what the patient's goals are. Uh, you know, what is what is the goal here? Is it to uh, rejuvenate on a cellular level uh, the skin? Uh, is it to create more healthy tissue within the vagina? Yeah, I had I have patients. I had a patient just this morning who um, had Morpheus um, for an indication that, I, you know, I don't think is necessarily going to get them where they want to go. And so we have to be careful about putting um, technology ahead. Um, I like to think that I offer the full spectrum of options so that, in fact, we could say, okay, what are your goals? Okay, well, this is what is going to get you there. And, and here's the value or the risks and benefit of each one and, you know, the, the success rates of each one and, you know, what I think might be a good thing or a good combination of things to get there. Um, you know, I'll answer the question about Morpheus. Uh, one of the reasons we brought on all these new technologies is because of what was happening within the Eurogyne space with respect to mesh complications, mm. uh, which is, of course, like one of my favorite topics is mesh. It's such a controversial area. It's a wonderful conversation I, I really enjoy having with patients. Um, they'll often have Googled stuff or have known somebody who had a mesh complication. I feel that, my, you know, I, have a, I, I, I love tackling mesh complications with patients uh, because I think there's a huge 
um, quality of life improvement that can be had oftentimes, whether it's even non-surgical physio stuff, surgical stuff, combination of the both. And so patients, you know, might have incontinence. They might have prolapse. Um, and they want an option that's good that doesn't involve mesh. And so that led to, okay, what else is out there that doesn't involve mesh? What else can we be doing that's augmenting surgeries that we're doing or maybe doesn't require surgeries? And so that led to um, looking through the literature, what different options there were. You know, at that time there was laser uh, and then there was radio frequency. And then a little later on, there was radio frequency with microneedling. And so all of a sudden you have an option that does have some evidence behind it. There are some randomized trials there. They're not perfect. We need to acknowledge that. But there is evidence there, and there's really good evidence that it's safe, um, that there really isn't going to be harm, which is critical. Nothing comes through the door in terms of technology that is unproven and that has to, you know, it has to be safe. So, uh, so we 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 stumbled onto uh, Morpheus Eight. Uh, which is a technology that involves energy. That's what ultrasound, laser, radio frequency is. And it's combining that synergistically with microneedling and the benefits of that uh, to basically stimulate elastin collagen production. Uh, and so there is evidence that it does help uh, with vaginal laxity. It helps with you know, incontinence, overactive bladder. And so that is one of the reasons why... Um, Morpheus 8 became part of our practice. Is it perfect for everyone? No. Does it help? Yes. And so one of the things we need to think about, particularly within urogyne, is you know, we're really good at moving things here and there. Surgery is very macro. You're pexing things and plastying things <laughs> and, and doing stuff, right? But what are you doing at a cellular level? Because we have a 30, sometimes even up to 50% failure rate with some of these surgeries. And that's just not, you know, that's not me alone. That's that's in the literature, that's everybody. I quote what's in the literature. Um, you know, they haven't invented the perfect surgery yet, the perfect surgeon. Um, and so we strive to provide good, safe, evidence-based options. And so I like the idea of surgery um, to restore tissues, to restore the architecture of the pelvis, right? But then what about working on a cellular level at the same time? And now all of a sudden, we're doing macro stuff and micro stuff together. And so this is where I think there's opportunity within our little field of medicine uh, to benefit patients. And so Morpheus 8 is, is, a, is a way of helping on the cellular level to make those tissues a little bit better. Sometimes that's all you need, and sometimes you need more, which is maybe surgery or physio. Uh, or a pessary, or a little bit of estrogen in the vagina. But then you got to harness all of these tools um, that will hopefully give you the best possible outcome. Yeah, I love that. I um, it, it's I have a few other questions added on to that. So coming back to Morpheus 8, I love what you said about, you know, there's the, the architecture and then there's the tissue and potentially there's an opportunity for both. So is there times where you would have done a surgical procedure and while potentially the person is uh, under the anesthetic from the surgical procedure, would Morpheus 8 be performed at that time or is it something that would happen at a later date? Both. You can do it before, uh, you can do it during, you could do it after. Morpheus 8 in particular, um, is, uh, and I, I have no disclosures. We, we, you know, own a machine, but I'm not paid by the company. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you get, the, you have um, three sessions, usually a month apart. Uh, I like doing one during the OR if I can, because the patient is often anesthetized, whether it's local or whether they're asleep. And so they're pain free. Yeah. So that's one thing I've heard about. I think there's Morpheus happens on the face as well. And a lot of people talk about microneedling on the face being very painful. So if I think about it in the vagina, I think that would be extra painful. So what happens, like, how do you manage that pain for somebody who's not under anesthetic, who's, who's not in a surgical situation? Is there, is it numbing cream or local anesthetic injected or how does that work? Right. Yeah. And so the important thing is at the end of the day that the patient, you know, has the best possible experience and has the best possible outcome, both. 
So both are important. How do you get there? You know, it depends on the patient. So we have a numbing cream that we use topically, uh, whether it's the vulva or the vagina. And so usually we give people a good 45 minutes of freezing before attempting any procedure uh, with the Morpheus. Um, I, there's, there's you know, ways of, of using the Morpheus machine. Uh, so I tend to go uh, lowest energy level, lowest uh, depth of penetration of the needles at the beginning. And even before that, for instance, um, we'll, we'll do a V-tone just to give it extra time to work the anesthetic. And then, again, starting with low energy and low um, depth of penetration of needles in order to drive the uh, freezing into the tissues and then stepping up from there. So those are those are sort of little nuancey things that we do. Um, we do have access to um, laughing gas and so on for patients as well. Um, so that's another option. Uh, we can provide local anesthetic uh, if necessary. It's not usually needed for uh, Morpheus 8, uh, but if we're doing Accutite, which is more invasive, um, but also radio frequency, then we're, we're injecting local into the tissues. Okay, so I didn't see Accutite, but you talked about V-Tone, so I'm gonna to go to V-Tone first. So what is V-Tone? And you, you mentioned that potentially the person may do both of them in the same, the same appointment with you. So what is V-Tone and how is that working? Yeah, V-Tone is just deep uh, radio frequency energy. Uh, again, uh, we heat the tissues, excuse me, the tissues to 42 degrees. Uh, and uh, and that's for sort of deeper penetration. It goes all the way down to the uh, levators, the pelvic floor muscles, in a very safe way. 42 degrees is not enough to cause a burn in any sense. Uh, that's one of the benefits of Morpheus over laser. There's no burns. Uh, the machine uh, has a shutoff, and if it gets above that, it, it no longer delivers energy, so it's extremely safe. Uh, and so we do deep radio frequency, and then we do the superficial radio frequency, which is, you know, one to three or four millimeters depth of penetration uh, with the Morpheus. And so we combine the two. Um, and so we'll use V-Tone or Forma V, you know, in the States it's called Forma V. And then we'll use the Morpheus 8 uh, or Morpheus 8V, just different uh, microneedling tips uh, that, that we have with our machine. Accutite. Accutite is just, uh, again, using the uh, radio frequency. It's the same machine. Uh, and what that is, is it's able to actually deliver uh, the energy deep into the tissues. And so you could actually perform non-surgical labioplasty with Morpheus, with uh, Accutite. Um, that's for very subtle changes. Uh, and so it's, you're not going to have the same impact you would as with labioplasty, for instance. Uh, but it is a non-surgical way of performing a labiaplasty. Uh, it's used um, not, not by me, but uh, I tend to stay in my lane, uh, but certainly you can use that on arms, on chins, on faces uh, as well. Um, but I like to I like to stay in my lane and focus on, on my area of expertise, yeah. Got it. And how does the V-tone differ from Viviv? Right, so Viviv was the initial, we actually have a Viviv machine. That was the first one we bought. Uh, we still have it, it um, and, and that's radio frequency, uh, but it doesn't have the microneedling. And so um, when it came time to updating our equipment, we did a little scan, you know, had a look at what was out there on the market, and we found that um, the Morpheus would be a better option for our patients. And so we do have both, but we tend to use the Morpheus. Got it. And it's, so it's just to clarify with V-Tone and Viviv, is, does V-Tone have microneedling as part of it as well? Or so how would V-Tone differ from Viviv? Uh, they're very similar. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, I, I would be, I'm not exactly sure of the difference because I, I think they would both be, you know, very similar technologies. There right. are probably some nuancy differences there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think the V-Tone is a bit quicker in terms Got of it. time. Okay. Okay. And then I want to move on to PRP, which, so PRP, I've heard it called PRGF, platelet-rich plasma or platelet-rich growth factors. So this is, if anybody's seen the vampire facial, that's similar to kind of where it started, but it's been used in regenerative medicine. 
the O shot is a version of the application of PRP within the vagina around the vulva. Like I see tremendous opportunity here. And you mentioned earlier how you may involve Morpheus as part of a surgical procedure. And I know that there are physicians who are incorporating PRP as part of their surgical procedures to potentially encourage healing or better outcomes maybe. So what, from a PRP perspective, what pr um, protocols are you using in your office? Uh, like, is it just the O-shot or are there other ways that you could potentially be using it for vaginal rejuvenation? That's a great question. And so again, this is another, it's not that new, but it's certainly the application is fairly new. The evidence I think is still evolving. It's in early, you know, early phases. What we know is it's safe. It's your own blood spun down. We remove that buffy coat that has all the platelet-rich plasma, the healing factors, um, stem cells, and inject that back into the body. So, you know, it's been used, I think, in orthopedics for a long time. And so there is some evidence emerging that it does help um, with tissue healing. So our application, yes. So we use it at the time of surgery. Sometimes we'll just use it at the time of a Morpheus or on its own. Uh, and we so we draw the blood, spin it uh, in our centrifuge, and then inject that uh, platelet-rich plasma back into the body. And we'll do that into, for instance, at the time of labiaplasty to help healing. Uh, and then it can be injected into the periclitoral tissues, uh, into the uh, just under the bladder in the vagina. Um, and so lots of different applications there. Uh, there's emerging evidence that it can be used for lichen sclerosis. Uh, so again, um, need to be careful in terms of um, really sticking with the evidence, but also yeah. making sure that you're safe. Uh, and so this has been around for quite some time. There is good safety data. Uh, and we have a lot of very happy patients. Mm -hmm. And how do you manage, like, again, thinking of a needle inside the vagina that doesn't sound super comfortable. So is it something that they can also have numbing cream? Uh, is there a way to manage pain or is there pain when you're injecting in the vagina? Right. And so that's critical. Again, you know, uh, good experience, great outcomes, happy patients. Uh, so we, we use numbing cream. And I use a little bit of local freezing. Got it. Cool. Um, what have I not asked? That's, I think, the list that I had here of what I wanted to ask about. But um, is there any, like, I asked from a surgical, any other non-surgical that I didn't ask about that you offer? Um, that's a lot. <laughs> no, I think that's a lot. I think that the important thing to know is that, you know, we want oftentimes we're just there to reassure patients and in fact that they are normal that there are normal changes that happen throughout patients life that you don't need surgery necessarily this is um uh, you know you have to love your body mm -hmm. uh and so oftentimes patients just come for conversation uh and <laughs> and we need to and, and and you need to undo the damage that some horrific person may have done at some point in their life telling them that they have a problem. Uh, you know, it's heart-wrenching. And so um, a lot of times it's just reassurance and, and education, right? This is what, you know, the wall of, of vulva looks like. This is normal. Uh, we need to celebrate it. Certain cultures, bigger is better. Certain cultures, smaller is better. You know, it's all a variation of normal. And I think that's the real take-home message is really to, to provide that education to patients. I am not in the business of taking away um, options from women. We're in the business of providing good, safe options. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, whether it's um, pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, whether, you know, it has to do with uh, cosmetic stuff, um, you know, this is... Uh, that's what we're here to provide, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, there, there's so many great, going back to where we started with, you know, why you're a guy, there's just so many great options uh, mm -hmm. that we have. And, you know, the hardest part for me is that patients 
don't know that there's an option out there, that providers don't know to refer because they don't understand that we have so many great technologies um, available to patients that are minimally invasive, uh, that don't involve mesh, that are that are natural tissue, uh, you know, for prolapse, for incontinence, um, and that we have this amazing network of urogynecologists throughout the province of BC um, who are able to provide the full scope of all of these options, when it, particularly when it comes to urogyne, uh, non-surgical and surgical options. Uh, and so that piece is really important uh, from an advocacy point of view. Uh, we need more urogynes. We're desperate in BC for people who can provide these options to patients in a timely fashion. Right now, um, wait times are absurd for consults. Yeah. Wait times are ridiculous for surgery. Uh, this needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, you know, and we are certainly working on it. Uh, and and I'm optimistic. I, I'm a, you know, I have rose-colored glasses, but I am optimistic uh, mm -hmm. that we are going to continue to make improvements. We're working together as a group as well to make those improvements happen. Um, but there's so many wonderful things out there. Uh, Botox yeah. for overactive bladder. You know, one of my favorite things. Uh, yeah. What a difference that makes over some of the traditional forms of therapy. Yeah. Um, you know, we're working at getting that covered. Whereas before it was expensive, now within a lot of our centers, it's covered. That would be amazing. For patients. Um, and so, you know, there's certainly a lot of layers to the onion whether we're talking about incontinence, prolapse, pain, mesh complications, or cosmetic um, yeah. procedures, again. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I forgot to ask that you just brought up um, before we go, if, if I may, you talked about your passion for mesh. And I guess a question, is there mesh ever used in any of the cosmetic labiaplasty, vaginoplasty? Um, and then also just if you can clarify mesh is still used in many surgeries, but it is different from the mesh that created the complications. So can you just maybe explain what is different for those that may, may be mesh is something that really would make their surgical outcome better, but they're afraid of using it. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about the mesh before we run away? Yeah, when you say passion for mesh, um, <laughs> I, I, I think passion for the conversation. Yes, okay. For dealing with people who've had complications from mesh, um, yes. but um, within so within uh, cosmetic gynecology at this point, at this moment, I don't see any indication for the use of mesh. Uh, probably contraindicated. Uh, in, in Even with incontinence can... surgeries like the slings. Oh, that's not cosmetic. Oh, cosmetic. Um, sorry. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, for, so for, for cosmetic, cosmetic only. Got it. But, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a time and a place for mesh. And uh, when you go back to what was happening in the late 90s and the early 2000s, uh, you know, if I, if I can just take a second, you have to remember, um, you know, what was the problem? The problem was that surgeons were treating patients and they were seeing, you know, failure rates in, in the realm of 30% and, and disappointed patients. It's really hard to have a patient who comes back who's, undergone surgery and the risks of surgery and pausing their lives for weeks and weeks and the discomfort of surgery and then, you know, to have a failure, uh, whether it's early or late, you know, it, it, it's it's hard to see a disappointed patient um, and, and to navigate them then through that. And so they said, well, there's this great thing out there, this mesh that's used thousands of times every day for hernias, right? Uh, let's try that. And... Unfortunately, uh, what we saw was uh, a failure rate go from 30% to zero almost, but a complication rate that went from very low to, you know, 25, 30%. And the complications weren't small. They were life-alteringly bad. Uh, and fortunately, you know, when I started, when I was doing my, my fellowship and my training uh, and then early practice, you know, I was taking out mesh every week. Uh, and, you know, first we have to really learn uh, about the complications and how to treat them and then, you know, become expert at that. Uh, and that was, you know, my life for 10 or 15 years uh, was dealing with a lot of that every week, uh, dealing with mesh complications in the office, uh, in the OR. 
Uh, and uh, and fortunately now we're actually seeing very few. And I'll have months go by where I we really don't have any patients uh, come back with any mesh problems because you know most of that bad mesh is off the market. Um, all of the kits that were used, these these quick and dirty kits to um, place transvaginal mesh for prolapse are gone. Um, the there are no kits left. Uh, we for prolapse we have kits for stress incontinence, but again that's a very different uh, disorder. It's a very different kit. It's a very different application. Um, are there still issues with respect to um, incontinence slings? Yeah. You know, short-term complications are probably three to five percent, and maybe in 20 years, uh, we're looking at 10 to 12 percent. Um, most of those uh, can be dealt with sometimes non-surgically or through small surgeries. Uh, and uh, what we found is that there are fewer providers doing more surgeries, and I think that's helped with um, decreasing uh, the complication rate because you, you, the people who are still doing these procedures, I think, are having fewer and fewer complications and are doing a great job. Um, a lot of the, you know, so the, the bad procedures are gone. Um, so there is a time and a place. But I think uh, ultimately it's a, it's a consent a discussion that needs to happen and process with the patient. They need to understand um, the nature of the problem and all of the risks and benefits and the different options that are available. And so you know, it could be physio, it could be a pessary. They need to know that. Uh, it could be one of the various different incontinent slings. And we have other good options, uh, periurethral bulking, um, that, that I'm quite fond of, in fact, uh, for patients. That's a great non-mesh option. Uh, and so, uh, and then, of course, uh, using your own tissues to perform a sling. And so that's another option. And so we provide all of those options to patients. I can leverage each and every one of those options for a patient. We offer them all. Um, mm -hmm. We have a physio in our office. We have a nurse. We gladly refer to others in the community because, you know, we have this network. Um, and so that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the new technologies. So uh, when it comes to prolapse, uh, we are still doing uh, mesh uh, abdominally uh, or laparoscopically, but not transvaginally. Uh, and so uh, there is a time and a place for that. It requires a conversation with the patient uh, and um, an education, so that we, you know, that we go into this as a as a partnership, um, and that we, you know, everybody is aware of exactly what's going on, uh, the risks and benefits um, for doing this procedure, and you know, and what they look like. Right. So the mesh is is the application. Where the mesh is used is different now, but is also the formulation, what the mesh is made of, is that different as well? Or is that the same, it's just now not used transvaginally? So the application, yeah, the transvaginal application, uh, except for some research trials, uh, is really, there There are no kits. There, there is no um, easy way of, of doing that. And I'm when I talk about mesh, it's very important to acknowledge that we're talking about polypropylene mesh. This is, and what is mesh? Just probably should have uh, clarified that for uh, everybody. And so mesh is basically a woven fabric of permanent surgical plastic. It's like suture material that's woven into a scarf. that looks like a, um, a ribbon of material about a centimeter across and however long. Uh, and, and that's for incontinence slings. Mesh can be uh, found in a sheet material uh, that's used uh, Abdominally. So historically, there were four different types of mesh out there uh, when it came to um, pelvic floor surgeries, typically, uh, and all of those are gone except for type one mesh. And why? Why is that? What were the problems with mesh? Uh, and so, uh, it, mesh had to be monofilament, meaning it was just made of one um, fat, one one sort of suture material as opposed to a braided material that was woven together. So it had to be um, this uh, monofilament, it had to be non-absorbable. Uh, it had to be uh, macroporous, meaning uh, the pore size, just like pores in your skin. So the pores in the mesh had to be large in order to allow your immune system, the macrophages, to get in and fight infection. 
And uh, with some of the other types of mesh, the pores were too small, and so you couldn't fight, your body couldn't fight infection if, if it was infected. Um, so these are some of the qualities that make type 1 mesh type 1 mesh and make them safer. What we've also noticed um, since the early days of mesh is that it's more supple. Uh, and so, you you know, it, it feels more natural. Um, and that's very important in terms of achieving um, ultimately results. As I say to all my patients, everything has to look, feel, and work back to normal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll have to do a whole episode just on mesh, I think. But um, right. yeah, thank you so much. And, and I, I wholeheartedly agree and, and love your approach that this is a team, uh, a team we require kind of a village for our healthcare. And I also love that you are providing options. At the end of the day, we need information and we need options. We need to be informed so we can make the best choice for our own bodies. And I love all the work that you're doing to support that. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and for all the work you do to help women and men. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> funny. Um, well, so Kim, thank you. Uh, you know, we've uh, known each other for quite some time now. Uh, I think we probably got started in our careers um, around the same time. Um, and appreciate your advocacy and and, uh, and all the work that you do helping with education and knowledge translation and positivity uh, for women's health. I, I think it's just massive and so truly appreciate what you do and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, Fabulous. thank you so much. Yeah, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time.